So I'm not going to talk to you about genomics too much. You just heard some genomics, and, and we've heard wonderful uh, stories about that. But as I was thinking about uh, where I'm at and the folks that are here, uh, one of the guiding views, I think, that is sort of an assumption that we all make, I'm, I'm going to assume by many of the people in this room, is that is this quote that I saw in graduate school, um, that the more advanced the sciences become, the more they tended to enter the domain of mathematics, sort of a center towards which we converge, can judge the perfection of science by the facility more or less great with which is approached by calculation. And I would say, if, perhaps not just always calculation, but by prediction. When we really understand something, we can start to predict. We're hearing about with analytical models as far as predictive uh, analytics for customers, or for fraud detection. I think part of that is also what we're looking for in genomics and what I'm going to be talking about in a few other cases as well. I also uh, believe that one of the, the uh, comments made that in business data is king, well, I can tell you in science data is king as well. And uh, going to big data conferences and talking to folks when everybody's talking about data scientists uh, I was asked what I thought about data scientists, and I said, well, I thought all scientists were data scientists because a scientist without data is a philosopher. Uh, <laughs> so so I, I think that the, the integration that we're seeing in data uh, with high-performance computing is, is really being driven uh, by a lot of the other technologies that are out there right now. So what I'm going to talk a little bit about is some changes in biology that are occurring right now, where they're going, uh, talking about some data, and beyond just databases, how we're trying to merge this, and then how we're merging simulation experiment. I'm going to go towards the therapeutic side of where we need to understand in order to be able to develop therapeutics and to understand mechanisms fundamental to the biology, uh, which will probably come from high resolution imaging, as you see. And then Another part where we're talking about nanoparticles, and, and nanotechnology is a huge hot topic right now. And there's nanotoxicity as well as on the case of therapeutics. We can develop really interesting therapeutics, uh, especially for cancer, using nanoparticles. At the same time, when you put a nanoparticle into a system, especially if it's a byproduct of some manufacturing process or whatever, there can be unintended consequences. And so if you look at the little graphic down here, really what we're looking at is we're trying to integrate, as I think most everybody in, in research, this idea of how do we move from the genomics into understanding the chemistry of the DNA down to the physics of what's going on, basically, and we're going to be t using quantum chemistry to do that. So quantum chemistry has been a very large uh, consumer of high performance computing as have molecular dynamics. And as we start merging this to try to understand all of the uh, science behind that, uh, that's driving an interesting challenge, I think, for high performance computing. And I know that if you have questions about the systems that we have and everything, Bob Leberts from uh, Frederick National Lab is sitting back there in the back. I'm not going to talk about hardware. I'm going to talk about the science because I'm more comfortable there and I just it's a lot more fun. Okay. So here's simple biology. When I first started learning biology way many eons ago in high school, it was very, very simple. And you know, you had genomes, you had DNA, and it went to RNA, and then you had proteins, and that did all of the stuff. And that was a nice, simple thing, and it was really cool, and we could solve all of this. So this was the whole idea many, many years ago. We'll be able to predict everything with the computer once we learn it, and it'll all be great. Okay? But the answer is, it's not quite so simple. Uh, you know, we, we have a lot of other things going on, and you start seeing uh, various types of uh, uh, pattern recognition that we're putting together to try to do this annotation that Shane was just talking about. If once you see variations in the genome, what, what does it actually mean, and what are the implications? What are the phenotypes that we're seeing? Um, in cancer, it's a little bit different. We have somatic mutations where it's not in the germline, which means that you aren't necessarily born with it. Something happens while you're alive, and you get this mutation, and then it turns into a cancer. The problem is, is there are these, lots of these random mutations taking place all the time. What's really driving a cancer and what causes one cancer to be different from another? And so trying to understand that. So you put together a lot of databases and you pull things together uh, from protein expression and, and everywhere. 
And we're trying to integrate all of these, and these things are starting to interact back and forth now, where the transcriptome, we know that RNA actually goes back and regulates the DNA, and proteins are regulating the genomes, and, these, and the proteins and the RNA are forming complexes, and small molecules and all the drugs are, are interacting with all of these. So, and then timing is a really important matter as well. So there's a lot of complicating factors that you go on. But in, in reality, it's actually closer to this. And I pulled this off of uh, complex systems biology, which is what we're looking at right at the moment, where we're an organism that moves in an environment. And so we interact with our environment all of the time. And so if you look at the heart, or say the liver for this case, and it's interacting with all the other systems within the body. So that's an environment. And if you look at the feedback loops, which many folks in physics and, and complex systems have looked at for a long time, when you introduce these nonlinear effects, you get some really interesting behavior. And that's what we're trying to understand with the human body, and especially what's happening in cancer. And I pulled out a quote over here on the side, and some may argue with this, and I'm not going to argue the, the conclusion, but the point was, it says that, that cancer cells can be inserted into an animal and not develop into a tumor, suggests that the characteristics of the cells themselves are still influenced by the environment in which they're inserted, which we actually know. I mean, there's interesting cases where you can take a tumor cell and you can put it under force and it reverts back to a normal type. So the environment and the feedback loop that we have on this is very, very interesting. And understanding that is going to help us understand, first of all, how to diagnose cancer, how the progression goes, how to be able to visualize or, and to understand metastasis, hopefully predict that, and then hopefully come up with really, really good uh, therapies. Also, I would say that the, as you start looking at the personalized genomics that Shane just talked about, and there was the question about insurance agencies, being able, I think pharmaceutical companies are also uh, interested in being able to take this data and target their therapies, because there's a lot of therapies out there that are failing on, in uh, clinical trials only because we're not choosing the right strata of patients. And so being able to make that proper stratification of patients, the ones that are most likely to be able to benefit from treatment, is really critical in where we're going. Trying to understand that and put all the system together, that's part of where we're really trying to go. Okay, so going beyond databases, we've, we've heard about databases and we've been playing with NoSQL type databases, graph databases, and different types of analytics to be able to speed up the processes that we have because we want to bring together all of these processes that you see from the body, that there's a tumor here. I want to be able to know all of the information going on, because I don't only want to know the genome, I have to know the epigenome, which is the methylation patterns and everything else that's on top of that. I have to know the RNA that's being uh, produced. I have to know that there's a mutation in that. And then I have to know basically what's going on in the pathways down here. But then there's a lot more information that I need to know as well. I need to know all that at the same time, and I need to know that in some sort of a time locality. Okay? So this is really an interesting problem, if you will. It's also a problem that's quite vexing, and uh, we need to make much more uh, progress. One of the interesting, if you've been reading the literature or reading the paper and looking at these immunotherapies on cancer, and some of those are making really fantastic process, progress, uh, understanding the immune system, and I'll have to say I'm one of those first people to just look at the immune system and go, this is a giant mystery to me. Uh, but then I'm a theoretical chemist slash physicist, so um, perhaps that should be that way. But how the immune system is also now interacting with everything else that we have to go back and fight cancer, and why sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't uh, win is another uh, challenge that we're trying to go towards and understand. So here's another um, example of where we're just recently, uh, very, very recently, you can see September 11th, it's what, five days ago, uh, there was a article in Nature, and it talks about new antibiotics coming out of investigating the vaginal microbiome. Now, I'm sure that if you've looked at the even New York Times or anything else, you understand that the microbiome is that thing that we call that has all of these uh, 
uh, bacteria all over us, on our skin, and our gut, and everywhere else, and that it interacts with us. It's a symbiotic relationship with our system. It actually, we know that it, uh, a healthy microbiome can facilitate chemotherapeutics against cancer. We know that in certain other cases, if you remove the healthy microbiome, that you have a really poor prognosis. Uh, but not in all cases. Again, it's this not in all cases, is, which is always the real problem I'm trying to get to. But the thing I like about this example is it says, this is an integration of lots of data where basically the power of bioinformatics not merely identify genes in the interest from big data omics, but to connect together the cassettes of genes. So having multiple genes together, not just a single gene, but many, 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 many processes happening at the same time is and understanding how that affects human health is another dimension that we have to understand at the same time. Again, I think it's been talked about several times here. When you take all this information and you put it into a silo, you get different views. It's kind of like I could show the picture of the, the blind men with the elephant, right? Everybody has their own view, but it's not until you have a holistic view and you can see all of it at the same time that you start getting some sort of an inkling of what's really going on. Sometimes it's more compli complicated, and sometimes it's, sim it's simpler. Okay? So I'm going to really be talking for a little bit now uh, about developing therapeutics and what we're going to need in order to get there. For the functional understanding, drug development, what we really do is, is for years and years and years, we've had 3D structures. We develop a 3D structure from X-ray crystallography. And you know that if, if you've ever tried to do this experimentally, you realize you have to grow these crystals. They have to be nice diffracting crystals. They have to be relatively large. Um, that's a real challenging problem, especially for the molecules that uh, are you know, uh, in the membranes, hard to solubilize. Generally, it's real easy ones that we get. Uh, so there's been some changes recently. And I don't want to uh, just talk about x-ray. I mean, if, uh, Susie Tishner's here from Oak Ridge. Uh, the spallation facility, being able to generate neutrons is also a great uh, resource that's changed the way that we're doing structures. But I do want to talk about how certain technologies from other fields are changing the way that we're going to be doing uh, biology and life sciences. The bio x x is the free electron laser. laser. Uh, bio x is a prop program that's just recently been funded, University of Buffalo. Uh, and so just to, to see kind of how things, we're going to be generating roughly 40 terabytes a day. And the next generation, when they up the uh, uh, laser intensities, uh, we would be able to generate up to 150 terabytes a day. Now, that's a lot of data, especially if you have to analyze it and try to make something. But then there's a lot of real interesting information that you can pull out of it. Electron microscopy, of which we're doing at Frederick National Lab, uh, is now generating about one and a half terabytes per day per microscope. And putting together the three-dimensional structure of antibodies attached to membranes, of looking at receptors, is, is starting to give us a real in-depth look at what's going on in the biology at the cell level. And voltage uh, microscopy, I'll talk a little, little bit, uh, how we're using that for soft particles, especially nanoparticles. <clears throat> so what's really driving all of this? What's fueling these advances that are coming? And I would say changes in the physics. We have a brighter light. We have lasers. We've got a lot of interesting places that uh, Argon has the advanced photon source. Uh, the national labs, other national labs for DOE, are driving a lot of interesting instrumentation so that life scientists are now able to utilize these resources. Uh, this is a kind of a picture where the, the laser beam is coming in. This way, uh, drops are coming in, and they're being blown apart at a fifth, femtosecond uh, time frame, and then the detector is being able to uh, detect. And what we're starting to see now is not just where the atoms are sort of in an envelope. We're starting to see where the electron density is in the envelope. We're starting to get down to the point where we can actually start to see chemistry and stop guessing about a lot of things, but actually put them together in models, which I will also show in a second. The other one is better detectors and cameras. And we're, we've seen, uh, we've talked about GPUs and accelerators here uh, for a long time. Uh, and I remember one of the first meetings that I was at where we talked about them many years ago 
And there was an argument of FPGAs and accelerators and GPUs. And I knew a lot of people that said that we'll never use GPUs. And I asked how many people had a GPU. Well, so does every graduate student, and so did every student. So people started developing. It became accessible. It's now pretty much mainstream into high performance computing. It was one of those interesting things that kind of came in through the back door. Okay? I think camera technology and detectors. That's been developed for both astronomy and for the consumer market is coming back and it's modifying the way that we're starting to do biology and what we're being able to detect as far as in the optical and also X-ray and other ranges. So there's there's merging trends. I think uh, it was shown how big data and everything else all kind of came together at this focal point. We're starting to see that same focal point. It's going to be a lot of changes and computation is going to enable us to be able to make use of that uh, data. So. Just want to talk about this just real quick second. What's, what's fundamentally changing? What's the real game changer? Well, one of them is crystals can be a thousand times smaller, which means that material that we can never use before is now accessible to us. That's a good thing. So now we can start getting structures of many, many, many more proteins or uh, biological material. It's also going to rely heavily on mathematical algorithms. There's going to have to be new algorithms and new, new software. And we're starting to see the motions of molecules for the very first time. We're starting to see real time. Okay, What we're starting to do now in order to reach what I call chemical resolution, it, with these high resolution, ultra high resolution structures, that we need finding where proteins, protons are, that those are the, the hydrogens, if you will, in, uh, in the molecules in the proteins, which are really important for catalyzing reactions. That will help us with NMR refinement. But by combining quantum mechanics and some careful matching with electron density, different algorithms, instead of doing a reciprocal space, I don't know if you've done X-ray crystallography, going in a reciprocal space, solving the equations, coming back, we can do this stuff in real space with simulation. So the simulation is running at the same time as we have with the electron density. Okay? And so these are the kinds of maps that we can start to get down here. Here's a reaction coordinate. Here's the orbitals. We can start to see a reaction actually taking place. And so here's what, this is a, a, an example that's not published uh, yet. And it's the reaction center. And what I really want you to point to is here's some interactions with, uh, this is a um, carboxylic acid. And here's an amine. And you're going to see Here's a tyrosine, which normally, here's their proton. And you're going to see some reaction going on. Now, let me tell you how this was put together. Ultra high resolution x-ray structure. You get a large envelope of electron density. We ran quantum mechanical calculations. We got the probability distribution of the positions of all of the atoms and then ordered them in such a way to put them together in a movie. Okay, So this is a bunch, if you will, a bunch of snapshots simultaneously to be able to put this together. That's not what I wanted. OK. OK, and you can start seeing this motion. And primarily, what you're starting to see at that point was chemistry happening. So we're starting to be able to get to the point, and I know this is a really short movie, but we're starting to get to the point where we're actually extracting a lot more information than we used to be able to extract. Because all of that vibration that we saw before that we threw away as noise is actually an ensemble of different structures. Okay. So if I go on beyond that, and now I take these nanoparticles that we're engineering now, and if you look in the middle of these nanoparticles, and here, this is the image of a nanoparticle from a low voltage electron microscope, and we're using these to be able to try to get high contrast. Right? So there's different ways that you can get better images. You can either try to get higher magnification or you can get higher contrast. So if you can go to high contrast, you, then you can come in and you can get better images we can put together an initial model. And then what we do is we put together an atomistic model. And this one has 670,000 atoms in it. To be able to determine what a self-aggregating nanoparticle based off of 
a particular small peptide was creating the cavity which is being used to deliver chemotherapeutic agents. Being able to understand that starts to tell you what kind of drugs you can put in and what kind of properties that you have. That is now going towards a much more rational design. We know that the hydrodynamic radii, if we just look at this, is 22 and a half nanometers, but yet that's what this really looks like. You can't tell from here. It takes simulation to be able to go to there to be able to really understand how do you load a nanoparticle with a drug so that you can develop a therapeutic. Okay. This is also important for industry and business and, and pharmaceutical companies because the FDA is now starting to look at how do I get this information on nanoparticles. If you look at nanoparticles, the other interesting thing about them is there's a, something called polydispersion. You think that you have a nanoparticle, and it looks like whatever it does when you designed it. However, they age, and there is a whole distribution of what these particles look like, especially from a manufacturing process. So what you thought you had today isn't what you had tomorrow. Okay? And so it's basically coming down to the point where if you look over here, we really have to start looking at that risk profile. Can we start making predictive uh, inferences based on what we already know and the properties that we can calculate to be able to move forward with, with uh, uh, these particles. Because quite honestly, some of them, if you look at the animal studies, they're quite nasty. You do not want them around. Okay. If you look at the genome nanotoxicity, this is where nanoparticles get inside of the cell and they disrupt the nucleus. Okay. So the genome is being broken up, the nucleus is being broke up, so that you now have really massively uh, uh, damage uh, to the cellular level. Being able to automate these kinds of workflows is a really, really important process that we're going through right now. And I will say that you know, th this question of enterprise, high-performance computing, clusters, all this kind of stuff, really, and I will talk about a little bit, what we're really pushing towards is being able to impact the workflow of the scientist and the researcher and the medical person. Just as what Shane was talking about, trying to bring the diagnosis of infant uh, disease down to as short a time as possible, that is impacting their workflow. They are no longer ordering as many unnecessary tests and they're getting to a diagnosis much, much faster. We're impacting the person who's actually solving the problem. Okay, so looking at just challenges for HPC. Right now, just the integrating of big data into what's been called in some term enterprise HPC so that we can enable workflows and heterogeneous technologies because we're, we're, no one's using just a single uh, homogeneous environment anymore. You've seen from every speaker virtually, there's no SQL, there's Hadoop, there's graph analytics, there's literature uh, databases, there's all sorts of information. There's experimental information coming off of these instruments that we're collecting. Integrating all of that into a solution is really, really a challenge because not all of it is easy to understand. And the system may need to be tuned or balanced in a different way than you do from high performance simulations where I'm just wanting as many flops as possible. Uh, integrating, I, I think for us, a challenge of integrating heterogeneous computational technologies where we're trying to bring in a CPU, a big memory, and accelerators, and everything else working together. Uh, it's a, it's a challenge, I think, to the hardware folks. It's a real challenge to the software folks. It's a real challenge to life sciences software folks, uh, as you'll see a little bit. Uh, efficient software to efficiently make use. This is something I've complained about for, for years. Uh, we have really, really, uh, you know, Moore's Law has helped us along the way, and so now we're all the way up to, what, a few percent of theoretical peak performance. Uh, you know, let's, if we make that by a factor of 10, just so that you get, let's say, 30% of performance off of your processor, then you got a 10x performance, roughly, of, of your application. Um, and integrating people. I mean, trying to find people is, is a challenge. I don't know if all of you guys have, can find all the people or not, but every conference I go to, it's hard to find talented people who actually understand HPC. And I just want to acknowledge all the folks before I make a real quick switch, because I still have a couple of minutes. Um, these are the people that have been uh, applying a lot of the uh, solutions. 